I just started doing that yesterday. Hi guys. Welcome everyone to another evening of Northshire Live. I'm David Wood. I'm the Northshire's uh, event manager in the, our Manchester, Vermont location. And I'm here as always with my good friend and colleague, Rachel, who is the event manager in Saratoga, our Saratoga Springs location. We've got a great event here for you tonight. I've been really excited about it. But before we get started, a couple of quick notes. We are recording tonight's event, but uh, don't worry, only the people who are unmuted and recorded in the little featured yellow box here are gonna be appearing on YouTube later on. Likewise, if you have a question, for our authors tonight. At any point during the event, please type it in the chat uh, box. Rachel and I will save them up and ask them then at the end during the Q&A. Um, and then finally, just a note of thanks. We really appreciate it. The support we've received throughout this year. It's been a hard year for independent bookstores and all local businesses alike. And um, we wouldn't be here without you. So we really appreciate it. Um, all right, uh, Rachel, uh, take things away, please. I am so very excited to get to welcome Megan Culhane Galbraith to Northshire Live tonight to celebrate the publication of The Guild of the Infant Savior. Megan is a friend and neighbor to our Saratoga store, and it's such a delight to get to celebrate this book with her. She's been nominated for two pushcart prizes and has appeared in publications including Tupelo Quarterly and Catapult. She's the Associate Director of the Bennington Writing, Writing Seminars and the Founding Director of the Governor's Institute of Vermont Young Writers. Tonight, she'll be interviewed by Jenny Booley, a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow in Nonfiction and the author of books including The Quick Scene and The Body. Please join me in welcoming them both to Northshire Live. Thank you so much. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Megan. <laughs> um, I was so delighted to reread your book for this event. Thank you for trusting me with your words. Um, thank you to Northshire Bookstore um, for hosting us tonight. Um, Megan, your book, um, The Guild of the Infant Savior, subtitled An Adopted Child's Memory Book, um, is a book about so much more. But I think it might be helpful to contextualize the book for readers who are not familiar with it. And I thought that your opening prologue sets such a nice path for the reader. And I was wondering if you could perhaps read to us from that um, opening piece. I would love to. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is the, the prologue of the book. And um, I don't know for anyone who's read it, like you'll, you'll see that it, it's accompanied by photos. And this in particular, you know, is led by the photo that's also on the cover, which is a, this baby doll that in the book is, is um, representative of me. So she's called Little Megan. Um, and, and so anyway, here's the prologue. Children play to control the world. When I was a child, I wanted to control my world because as an adoptee, I felt I had no control. I created small universes populated by all sorts of figures, friends to have tea with, monsters to defeat, and new miniature realms to explore. It was empowering to make all the decisions. So I built dioramas and imagined myself into another life. It didn't matter that the stage was tiny. These were worlds into which I could disappear. I'd just given birth to my first son when I found my birth mother, Ursula. I was 29 years old. I've changed her name here out of respect for her privacy. I learned she'd become pregnant with me and was sent away to the Guild of the Infant Savior, a Catholic home for unwed mothers in Manhattan. Years later, I began playing with a tin doll house I'd found at a local antique shop, a 60s era Marxy mansion of the same time period in which Ursula had been sent away to have me. I found a set of dolls from that era called the Campus Cuties. They were made from molded hard plastic like the toy soldiers of the time. The dolls had vacant stares and bullet bras like tiny hypersexualized blank slates. Little girls had painted some of my favorites their eyes were black blobs. I have some here. Their clothing was peeling off. I find them weirdly endearing. Their arms and legs are frozen in position, and their names imply the roles society cast for women in the 50s and 60s. Nighty night, lodge girl, stormy weather, and dinner for two. If the campus cuties were rendered in the flesh, they'd have 40-inch inseams, 
12 inch waists and breasts the size of beach balls. I hadn't been given dolls to play with as a child, no Barbie or baby alive. I had no doll to feed, nor did I ever change a doll's diaper. Yet here I was, a grown woman, a feminist, in love with these booby, leggy plastic dolls. I was also in love with the delicate baby dolls. They were fragile as eggshells and the size of a three-month-old fetus. I collected them with obsessive zeal. The dollhouse became a visual art project by the same name. I staged the cuties and babies in household situations and photographed them from an, the outside looking in. I realized it was a voyeuristic way of seeing a situation from an angle of removal. It gave me the space I needed to examine my adopted life through a different lens. It emphasized a dystopia that was right there before my eyes. I'd been the subject of many photographs, my dad being the photographer, but now playing with these dolls, I realized I'd also been an object, a doll. Behind the lens of my camera, I'm the director of my narrative. I've reclaimed a sense of control. Play calmed me down, allowed me to turn off my brain. And when I did, thoughts flooded in, memories returned. I became curiouser and curiouser. I began to ask uncomfortable questions. A window opened to a new way of seeing my reality. Ursula and I have known each other now for nearly 25 years. And after hearing her, her tell me stories, shot through her lens of memory, grief, and trauma. I realized we have more in common than just the circumstances of my birth. We had both disappeared into our fantasies. Mine was tiny, imaginary, and voluntary. Hers was all too real. We'd both been pregnant with shame. The child psychologist, Eric Erickson said, no one gets a dollhouse to play at reality, but reality seeps in everywhere when we play. As an adult, I see myself in early photographs and can identify the feeling of being fragile, helpless, and adrift. Like many adoptees, I've moved through depression, suicidal ideation, an eating disorder, anxiety, and sexual acting out. I've identified gashes of grief and shame, wounds I'd been licking instead of healing. Adoption is what Nancy Verrier called the primal wound, and the resulting feelings of abandonment shame and loss are due to the severed connection between birth mother and child when a baby is taken away. Children are innocent before they are corrupted by adults, said Erickson, although we know some of them are not. And those children, the ones capable of arranging and rearranging the furniture and dolls in any dollhouse are the most dangerous of all. Power and innocence together are explosive. I realize now that I don't need to apologize for my existence. The dollhouse became a lens through which I could see my birth mother and myself. I could safely question my personal history and interrogate the myths of adoption, identity, feminism, and home. As an adopted child, I'd felt like a thing to be played with instead of a person with her own identity. I'd felt looked at, but not seen. I liked the idea of reclaiming what home meant to me by playing in my dollhouse because I'd never truly felt at home anywhere, not even in my own body. Holding those fragile plastic babies in the palm of my hand made me realize I had to hold myself with the same delicacy. Play helped me unlock ways of expressing the paradox of my identity as an adoptee while exploring intergenerational trauma, erasure, abandonment, and the myths and family lore that factor into many adoptees' origin stories. The dollhouse photos in this book are recreating the original photos I curated from my adopted child's baby book, among other places. The original photos, like artifacts, appear at the end of each essay. In the dollhouse, I created a world where women rule on a 1 12th scale, a portal to imagine myself into my birth mother's life and her into mine. Our stories are fractured. Our narratives double back on themselves like an Ouroboros swallowing its tail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Thanks, Jenny. I think it's so powerful. I created a world where women rule on a 112 scale. Um, it's just so beautiful and enchanting and 
such a powerful statement. Um, so uh, your parents did not keep your adoption a secret. It wasn't a secret in the family. Um, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I was always, I always knew I was adopted. You know, my, my baby book says an adopted child's memory book. That's the actual baby book. But, you know, when you're a child, you just don't know necessarily what that means. And I do remember as a child, I had a, uh, I had a little bit of a processing thing and I had a, a list too. So I would mispronounce the word adopted. I think I used to say a pop did or something, but yeah, so no one really explains it to you. And as an adult, looking back on these images, I started realizing the gaps in the gaps in this book, as opposed to like the gaps in my biological sister, you know, my sister who's a biological uh, one, you know, I had no newborn photos. I sort of arrived on my parents' doorstep as like this fully formed chubby little toddler, you know, with teeth still showing. So yeah, it wasn't a secret. There was no like, you know, no finding out. Um, and when I was an adult that, oh my gosh, I was adopted. Um, but I think that's also some of the mystery about adoption is like, you don't understand it until maybe you begin to question it. And usually that doesn't happen until you're an adult or until like in my case, I was pregnant myself and started to try to wonder about the mechanics of surrendering a child for adoption. Cause I was just so in love with this baby that was inside me. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it, not in a judgmental way, just in an trying to empathize in an empathetic way. Yes. Um, in, in one of the essays, I think it's Pregnant Pause, you write about how while you're attending a friend's uh, baby shower, you uh, had an envelope waiting at home with, you know, maybe some information from the agency uh, and you were, you know, dying to get home to open up this envelope, but you also, you know, speak about, uh, you know, Pandora's box and, and the box metaphor. Um, and I also like to think of that as another, you know, type of dollhouse. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so interesting to me that your fascination with dolls and dollhouses, in a way, um, was also the instrument um, to help you go through your process of curiosity, right? And, and um, knowing very well as an adopted child how, um, yes, curiosity can take over one's mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking about how dollhouses started to manifest in everything in the book for me, right? So mm -hmm. when we first confront the guild of the infant savior where your birth mother um, was waiting, um, to have her, to have you. And, yeah. um, uh, when we also confront the, the practice home of children who were called Domicon babies yeah. uh, with student uh, teachers, uh, it was just such an uncanny juxtaposition for me thinking about these types of houses and the type of play engaged in these houses and how it seemed to mirror your thoughts on, on doll houses. Um, so there's um, a passage um, on in the essay, Sin Will Find You Out, um, where you start to t uh, describe what the guild looks like. And I could only think, oh, it's, it's a doll house, right? Um, and I was wondering if you could um, maybe read um, that section there, and then I'm going to have you read another section so that we can see the juxtaposition of the Guild of the Infant Savior with the Domicon um, practice playhouse. Um, so that's on 32. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. Years later, I would search for photos of what the guild had looked like, but I could find only one from the New York City's municipal archives, a photo from the 1940s taken for tax purposes, showing a pair of mid 19th century Italianate brownstones missing their stoops. In the photo, they stood like widows holding hands. The window shades were drawn, 
as though the entire place had its eyes half closed, along with its triplet next door, made prettier by the grandly swooping front staircase, the buildings formed a quiet facade on a normal Manhattan street. About 20 unwed mothers were living there at the Guild when Ursula was there with me in 1966. Quote, I remember smells and boredom, Ursula said. We sat around waiting for our babies to be born. No joy in the waiting because we knew we were giving them up. Everybody smoked like chimneys. We sat in a dismal cloud of smoke in the living room on some old couches, watching a black and white TV. I imagined the girls perched like fat robins on musty donated sofas. They did their laundry, made their meals and cleaned. I can almost smell the cigarette smoke and Lysol. Changing the channel probably meant heaving themselves up to flip through television shows, adjust the rabbit ears or attune the three channels that marked with their tedious days. A typical Monday of TV watching in 1966 may have been like this, morning, I Love Lucy, Supermarket Sweep, The Dating Game, Father Knows Best. Afternoon, As the World Turns, General Hospital, You Don't Say, The Match Game. Evening, Bonanza, I've Got a Secret, My Three Sons, Bewitched, I Dream of Jeannie. Ursula told me the nuns rarely let the girls out of the guild by themselves. The few times Ursula convinced them to let her go out alone. She walked to the Central Park Zoo, sat on a bench and smoked cigarettes for hours, watching the penguins glide silently underwater. Great. And then um, the passage um, is on the bottom of page 89 in the essay, Hold Me Like a Baby, in the archival photos. Oh. oh. In archival photos, the Domicon practice apartment was appointed to mimic everyday life, yet it was void of the actual trappings of real life. There are images of co-eds vacuuming in front of near empty bookcases, and the nursery was outfitted with a one-way mirror where co-eds observed a practice mother caring for a baby from another room, as if they were in a living laboratory. No one lived full-time in that practice house. They may have slept there for a night or two, but mostly the co-eds appeared between classes and perhaps to take meals and to hand off a practice baby to another mother. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm so interested in the contrast of these two places because on the one hand in the guild, the mothers were practicing what you call the mechanics of surrender. Mm -hmm. And in the Domicon house, they were practicing um, for a life in which they would not have to surrender their babies. Um, but in both scenes, the women are heavily surveilled. Um, and you write at one point, um, if I step back and look at the Domicon experiment in motherhood and child rearing, it boils down to women observing women. And I'm wondering if you could talk about these windows. Yeah, yeah. I think the dollhouse opened up this for me because like you say, it's, it's this voyeuristic way of looking at things. And I wanted to play with that idea of photography as a lens, mirror as lens, um, and then how women see other women. You know, I think there's a long history in my research for this book. I found a long history of women shaming other women, you know, back to the 19th century in foundling homes. Um, you know, women would come to leave their babies and they would, these other pious women who were going to care for them would, would just shame them terribly for being unwed, for being single, for not being able to care for their babies, perhaps. And so I wanted to sort of look at all of that through this prismatic lens. Um, what does it mean to, because I think it says so much about even today, what we think about motherhood. I mean, think of the mom fluencers out there, right? everybody's so shamed for never being a good mother or, you know, whereas the child psychology of, of like Winnicott, who I love talks about the good enough mother, you know, and like the whole idea of, of, um, you know, adoption. I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent of babies should stay with their parents, right? Babies should stay with their mother. And many of these women wanted in fact to keep their babies. They were 
if you've ever read like the book American Baby, you'll learn the history of adoption is definitely not that women want to um, abandon their babies. They usually want to keep them, but society was not set up or is not set up for that. Um, and so just the harshness to me of uh, that Domicon program, you know, I think in, uh, a lot has been made about the actual program in terms of how it was actually quite feminist in the time it was started in the 19 in 1919 proponents like Eleanor Roosevelt visited campus you know there people thought this was a really progressive and feminist thing to do and a lot was made of those of those young co-eds sort of training to be mothers training for um you know the science of homemaking which is kind of laughable at this point. I was like I wish I could get a degree by vacuuming my house um but I think the tragedy when I went into those archives at Cornell was, you know, I just, I saw these babies and maybe it was because as an adoptee, I empathized with those babies. And suddenly I was like, wait, they used real live babies culled from foundling and orphan homes from around, you know, the area. One in Troy, right here where I live, right up the street, the Troy Foundling Seminary. Um, that's where they got babies. Uh, and just that practice seemed um, like a very, like another window that no one was looking at in some ways. And so I really went down the rabbit hole on that one. And, um, you know, I think those babies and that essay, which actually began as an art project, that essay began as like the images you see in the book was, it was art before it was words. And the that yeah that program I think really helped me figure out the structure of the book like the way you see the photographic images in in the book overall the idea of recreating you know and curating my baby book photos in the dollhouse came from that essay you know because you sort of struggle with structure when you're, you're trying to put a book together and my friend Walter said why don't you structure this as a baby book I was like, okay, I don't know what that means. And I walked around with that in my head for a really long time. And I thought structure had to be the way the essays were staged. So I like rearranged a whole bunch of things. And then, you know, one day I opened my, what like, this is what I do. I, I opened my baby book thinking there might be an answer in there. And I started to draw the little images that were attended to in the baby book. And suddenly I was like, wait, wait a sec, I can, this could be the structure, like the structures and the photographs. And so suddenly it kind of all fell together that way. Yeah, I, I was very struck by the power of the juxtaposition mm. between the real, the historical images and the text that you spliced onto the page and also your own rendering with your dolls of these scenes. And it was startling to me to see how um, having the doll images made the babies mm. more real mm. to me in my mind. Um, they did not appear to be historical artifacts anymore, but beings whose it. fate had been strangely twisted. And I think in your book, you also discuss how, um, you know, that they became commodified. They became uh, a commodity because who wouldn't want a baby who had been trained in the Domicon house? And this idea of training babies was something that we also discussed. Um, the idea that um, they had to be on a schedule and had to be ferberized, which is something that, you know, my um, mother-in-law who uh, came from, uh, you know, that certain era, era of time also uh, wanted me to partake in. And um, I was wondering if you, you could talk a little bit about um, the um, attachment um, disorder. And also there's moments in your book where you say, maybe I behaved in such and such way. Maybe I made such and such choice because I knew nobody would come to soothe me. Mm. And I found that extremely poignant and heartbreaking. Mm. Yeah, I think that's where my life's work is trying to figure out how to soothe myself. You know, um, I know that Ferber, that Ferber technique 
was something that doctors recommended to me as a mother also, like let the baby cry it out, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's a part in the book where I just, it, it, it overrides your circuitry as a mother, you know, it's like, well, this doesn't feel right. And I just wound up sitting in the hall crying, you know, and then finally going in in his little gasping body. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I think there's this, um, you know, constant way of, of overriding motherhood. My friend Elizabeth was like, never trust a technique that was named after the man who developed it. <laughs> and that's the fervor technique. Um, but attachment disorder is, uh, you know, again, it goes back to the primal wound. I think being immediately separated from uh, your mother at birth. And in my case, I was, I was separated and then I was in a foster home for about five, almost six months. And I remember my mom saying to me, just out of the blue, when I was a teenager, she just was like, oh, I always thought that you probably weren't picked up that much in the home, which I didn't know what the home meant because of this flat spot on the back of your head. And I just, you know, as a, I don't know, preteen, I can't remember exactly when she said that. I just was like, oh, I'm not sure what that means. And years later, you know, my therapist who specializes in adoption issues told me about attach attachment disorder. And suddenly it opened up this whole, again, a window into my past. And suddenly what my mom said made sense. And I was like, and then when I did all the research on the Domicon babies and how the science of the times, even in the sixties was don't soothe the baby. You know, it's like spare the rod, spoil the child. I don't know about you, but I always heard that as a, the other way around. I was like, like throw the rod away and spoil your child, you know, and hug them. And then when I came to find out it was, it meant something different, you know, it's sort of the same thing I came to with the discovery of like attachment disorder and now what it meant for my, my own life. And, you know, so fast forward, I think that manifests itself in many types of relationships. Like when you don't think someone is going to come soothe you, that means you don't reach out for help or you don't think asking for help is going to get you what you need, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that becomes, um, that becomes the work I think that many adoptees have to do is like identifying that and then trying to rewire um, a system to soothe yourself. And that's one of the reasons I think this cover of this book is this doll, little Megan is my therapist said, you know, you need to take care of your inner child, you know? That's your little Megan. And so, I mean, we all have our, we all have our child inside of us, right? And they come out in many different ways, but yeah. I still sleep with my little bun bun. <laughs> my little comfort object bun bun. <laughs> yeah. That's like my self-soothing technique, you know? Right. I'd love to I yeah. I think they refer to them as loveys now, right? Like that's yeah. that child's lovey. Um, and you've collected quite a few loveys over the years, certain gifts and trinkets from your birth mother. Um, you know, one of them is, is a watch fob. And, you know, in, in addition to surveillance, there's um, the, the use of, of time and, you know, thinking about fervorizing some of the anti-fervorizing um, people say that, you know, one minute in a child's mind, you know, is, is very, very long. It's not our idea of a minute. So letting them cry for 40 minutes uh, might be our idea of 40 nights. Um, you know, their, their sense of time is compacted by their time on earth. Um, and um, I, I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about um, the the idea of of time um in in, in this work um mm -hmm. and all of the um uncanny connections to time here um but i'm wondering if you could start by um reading on page 220 that first section or 220 it's a long book megan <laughs> It has a lot of pictures. <laughs> what do they say? I'm like, oh wow, 
the, back in college, I mean, back in grad school, I could barely write a, my end of term 10 page paper without illustrating it. And I'm like, look at this. That's almost a 300 page book. <laughs> I did a thing. <laughs> so this is from the essay where there is nothing left to hide, which is an essay about um, essentially female desire, but shot through shot through the object, which is the erotic pocket watch, <laughs> which I would be gladly tell you all about later. Ursula didn't begin to show until she was five months along with me. She said she kept waiting and waiting for her period to arrive. It didn't come, of course. So she was again forced into concealment in the late 60s, this time with 20 other unwed mothers at the Guild of the Infant Savior. Strict schedules, boredom, and the TV guide metered out their days. All we had was time, she said. They'd been sent to hide their secret shame. And then when it was over, they hoped to return to their normal lives as if no time had elapsed at all. Um, and then, um, speaking of erotic um, pocket <laughs> watches, I thought that that um, section juxtaposed um, very nicely with the passage starting on 223, these watches. Oh, sure. Yeah. So these, again, we're talking about erotic pocket watches. Um, these watches were rarely commissioned for wives. They were made for lovers and kept women, which meant a man could compartmentalize an affair and keep his lover neatly tucked away physically and metaphorically in his vest pocket, concealment being the exact reason for the thrill. In essence, men of the time had women exactly where they wanted them, in their vest pocket. Erotic timepieces convey desire in word and image, but always through the male gaze. Every single watch I've researched has a nude woman at its secret center. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm interested in how you see the idea of time running in the book. Um, and of course, uh, you come to find out that you are related to um, the architect of the clock tower in Brooklyn, which um, now is an apartment for Anne Hathaway and the mechanics of the watch had been taken out and it's now something that she can look out of, you know, this one way mirror. Um, but we used to call that clock the four faced liar when I moved there. And so maybe you can talk about secrecy and time and the gaze. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to talk about all those things together, but I think you're doing that here in this book. Yeah, you know, a time, I think even in the structure of the book, you know, like adoptees don't come to their narrative in a linear manner. And so mm. this book in this way with these different forms with, with, you know, it jumps back and forth in time, which was, um, it, ha it wasn't on purpose necessarily. It was just, that is the way the story had to happen. You know, I can't, I couldn't, I remember when I first started grad school, you know, I tried to write this linear narrative and it just, it wasn't working. And the reason it wasn't working was because that just wasn't the story. That's not how adoptees get their information. It's in, it's in bits and chunks and whatnot. But I'm very, I was very interested to, um, yeah, to examine the concept of time because I think over time, you know, so many things have changed for women but also nothing has really changed for women in some ways. And I wanted to play on that. And I wanted to think about, um, especially in that, that erotic pocket watch essay and then beyond like the idea of, of time and desire. And, you know, um, back in the sixties, you know, when my birth mother was sent away, if you take one narrative of what the times were then, you know, it's like, the summer of love and the sexual revolution and all those things that were happening, quote unquote, in the, in the, in society, but yet on the ground for women, women were being sent away, you know, in shame in these unwed mother's homes. And 
so just that sort of that paradox of time um, and like, what do we see through the lens of like the long lens of time for women and children? Um, and I think as I end sort of looking up again at that clock tower, thinking about the future, you know, uh, like feeling the future bearing down, which I wanted to also evoke the idea of, you know, a baby bearing down as you're getting mm -hmm. ready to give birth, because I feel like this was also a launching point. It wasn't just, this is not ending, you know, this is also a launching point because now having all this knowledge from writing this book, um, you know, this, in many ways, this book wrote me because just this had to come out. Um, but it's also, it's not end, it's a beginning. So I wanted to treat it like that too. Yeah. Um, speaking of bearing down, I couldn't help but notice when I read descriptions of your birth mother that her sense of humor and um, her way of expressing herself, you know, I thought to myself, oh, you know, of course that's Megan's mother, right? <laughs> um, that, that type of humor. And you talk about how you know, you wanted some sort of recognition, some, you know, either facial or, you know, some sort of clues in, in this world that you, you know, came from someone from somewhere. Um, and I was, oh, sorry. Um, we were talking um, previously about how, um, well, I was saying how beautiful the um, images that say permission not granted are right mm. and how that works with curiosity you get more and more curious the more you know and the mm. more you know the more you have to try to um figure out and at one point your birth mother said that she'd be an open book but something about putting um those yeah. you know so-called secrets into an actual book um sometimes cause um a change or, or a, a distance. Um, and then your, your mom who raised you um, passed away and, and you thought to yourself, I didn't know what to ask when she was here. So in a way, you know, um, that all those secrets are, are gone too, even though you knew her and um, so. I was wondering if you could talk about some of, you know, in terms of closure or non-closure, yeah. uh, the types of paths that you took with these two moms. Yeah. You know, I think the idea of, uh, <laughs> the idea of closure, especially in adoption is, it's just like a non-starter because, you know, um, at some point you have to, or I had to come to terms with the story I had, uh, the truth that I could find, um, because I'll never have closure. You know, I think I remember going on the train to see, uh, my birth mother for the first time thinking, this is surely it. I will have closure. I will have met her. And then on the train home, first of all, on the train down, I was so nervous. I had like explosive diarrhea on the Amtrak. So I just don't recommend, I 10 out of 10 don't recommend that, but, um, on the way home, then after a fun weekend, you know, walking around New York City and seeing the Guild of the Infant Savior, which is now the Hungarian consulate, you know, and spending all this time um, with my birth mother uh, on the way home, I thought, oh, shit. Now, now I have to have a relationship with her. <laughs> like, it just, that did not occur to me until on the way home. And I was like, well, that's going to be that's complicated, you know. Um, and it surely has been, um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't know what closure looks like in that respect. You know, I think I can close the book on this book and say, I probably will never write a book that's like this again. I hope not to, I felt like I was sitting in my poop, own poopy diaper writing this book, <laughs> you know, it was, it was quite an experience, um, to sort of mine this day in and day out. Um, but, you know, and, and it, I think closure gets to the idea of, of truth, you know, what is, what is truth, you know, like I can only tell 
my version of a story that was told to me like a bedtime story you know so mm -hmm. i'll never know exactly what my truth is you know i know i don't even have my original birth certificate you know it's in it's supposed to be coming i guess because new york opened their their um adoption you know you can actually request it but when i get that too you know is that going to be is that going to carry with it more surprises and is that going to send me down another kind of curious rabbit hole or is that going to make me feel some sort of closure like oh okay i have this um and i realize in the end you know I, like i have to make my own closure i have to be okay with with who i am which has been a long journey because i think at least for me as an adoptee it's it was very hard to come to the idea that like you know that i mattered that i uh was worthy you know and i say that very blatantly because maybe other people won't but you i did not feel worthy i didn't mm -hmm. feel worthy of asking for help of needing anything um and that's bullshit <laughs> so that's my closure uh, wait i can end on that that's bullshit <laughs> <laughs> Are we supposed to swear on this? <laughs> well, I love that you said, um, you know, as if you were writing your own bedtime story. Um, you do write in the author's notes about this being part memoir, part social history, and part bedtime story. And you use such um, different forms different ways of seeing into your story. Mm. Um, and one of them um, is the fairy tale um, and enchanting, re-enchanting yourself within the fairy tale realm. Um, and I'm just wondering um, if you could briefly talk before we uh, open it up to the audience about um, the different forms in the book and the information that essaying into these forms allowed you to um intuit yeah i well this is why i love the essay because of the myriad forms that that just assert themselves you know and and the many forms in this book i mean half the time i just didn't know what i was doing and the form would just the structure of the form would come out of of the work you know of what i was getting curious about like um and that fairy tale for instance i remember that was an essay that i i was working pretty hard on you know i was just, i spent like a month on the thing my friend had given me sort of this deadline she's like you need to write this this is a piece that's missing from the book and and so she's like you have a month now do it <laughs> And so I was writing it again in this sort of linear way and ugh, it just wasn't working and it wasn't working. And I was like, this sucks. And I don't, one day I just put once upon a time, I just thought once upon a time and all of a sudden it fell into place. Like within a week, it just all fell into place. And I think that forum asserted itself because what I was trying to, to play with was the idea of marriage as you know the fairy tale that's sold to women right mm. and my own guilt for leaving my marriage and um so i took a trope that was the prince rescues the princess and they live happily ever after to switch it around and be like i leave my prince and i rescue myself and i wind up having the keys to my own castle which is you know the empowering that's the you know it's this empowering kind of feminist trope the likes of which i love to read you know like leonore carrington and you know all these like at your work you know that turn like fairy tales on their heads and and remake myths into powerful statements because i think all those forms of storytelling are, are forms that are largely written by, you know, fairy tales were largely written by white men. And yet, as young girls were, you know, buried under our mother's arms, and they're telling us these stories as it's like, here's an introduction to the male gaze, everyone, you know, and so until we grow up and realize, again, uh, that's bullshit, <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, like <laughs> we just don't know to question them. And so that one particular essay, I, uh, I felt like it had to be a reclamation of my own power because that was what it was about also. And so that's, that's why I did that. It's a yeah. different type of doll playing. You reinsert yourself as <laughs> right. Yeah. Sleeping yes. beauty. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, it's been so lovely discussing your book, Megan. Um, and it was just so insightful to listen to some of your answers. It's so revelatory. And your powerful. questions are amazing. And I love, I love talking with you. I wish we could go more into fairy tales because yeah. So, and I love your work. So we do have time. We have time for some audience questions. Um, audience members, please um, type them into the chat, um, any questions that you have. And I actually have one to kick it off. Um, Megan, you didn't mention, I don't think, how you stumbled on the existence of the Domicon babies. I wondered where and when you discovered that story. Oh yeah, that was totally by accident. Um, I was at a residency at the Saltonstall Foundation and it was my first artist residency and I had boldly thought I will go for a month because that's what artists do and I don't know what I'm doing. And so I remember sitting there trying to write my book as you do. And I see uh, my friend Michael Morse is here tonight. He was, he was the poet upstairs. We were two writers there. And I just remember thinking, he's doing serious work and I'm not doing anything down here. And so I, I um, thought, well, maybe let's go to the Cornell Library because I'm just going to get some books to read, get out of my head, and I'll go to the library. And I don't know what string of, of search terms I plugged into like the library website, but again, down that rabbit hole I went and I was like, oh, what, what, this is here? Like these Domicon babies, ex like, the program exists, I can get into the archives. And so I just immediately drove over to the library and went downstairs. And I, I think, I don't know that I've ever been in an archive before. <laughs> so they walked me through it. I picked the boxes that I wanted and I just sat at this table in the back room with these surrounded by these boxes, just taking out pictures and I am not even sure if I was supposed to photograph them with my phone but I did and um, that's how I found them and then when I came back into my studio I had brought my dollhouse with me because it was at that time it wasn't I didn't consider myself a visual artist and I had a number of friends at Salton Stahl who were real real artists real visual artists and I remember coming back and when I would get stuck on the page I would play in the dollhouse a little and um, I began printing out those archival photos and thinking, gosh, the insides of those houses look like the insides of this dollhouse. And so I began staging those and tacking them up onto my wall in the studio. And my friend Samira came in and she's like, what's going on here? And, you know, she's like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> And so that's, that's how I found them. And every time I got, like I said, I got stumped on the page. I would just kind of look at them, look at those babies. And I began sewing those photos, like sewing those pieces of paper together with a kit that was just in my nightstand. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, I'm doing the same domestic tasks that those women were doing in those co-ed houses of the Jomacon building. And suddenly I began to like think about it in a different way and think about myself in a different way, having found those babies. But it was a complete accident. And I think just a result of being curious. So thank you for that question. Wonderful, yeah. that's a, a great story. <laughs> There's, uh, this next question is that from, or that request from Dr. Sybil Brown, Sib Brown. She says, um, please talk about how you are taking care of yourself as you share traumatic experiences daily as a result of the book. Oh. Tina Turner talked about how she spent a lifetime addressing her trauma and it's taken a toll. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think self-care is something that's, I struggle with trying to figure out what self-care, you know, what that means for me. Um, I actually think 
I think it's sometimes good for me to talk into the vulnerability that is this book. I think it somehow makes me with limitations, you know, it somehow makes me uh, feel that, you know, finding my voice and using my voice are two different things. So I'm, I found my voice through this book and now I'm using it and it's a little terrifying, but uh, um, you know what they say, fake it till you make it. But I do, I do appreciate, um, I do appreciate that you're watching out for me because it is something I think everybody who writes in from a place of trauma has to think about how, um, how they take care of themselves. And I'm very lucky. I have an amazing friend group. Uh, I know I can reach out to them at any time. And I think for me, asking for help and asking for what I need is, is something that is the best form of self-care for me. Forget the bath. Like, <laughs> let me call a friend. <laughs> There's a great question here from Chin Sun Lee um, saying, Megan, in the chapter, New York is beautiful. Stop where you take on Ursula's voice. How did you come to write it in the way that you did combining her journals with your narrative? Yeah, that was that mostly was a lot of her journal. That was her voice, at which I embellished. So it's a little bit like a tapestry, a little bit like a collage, but that was largely her voice as a, as a kid who ran away from home to New York City. Um, I filled in things like that, you know, I don't know if she flew into Idlewild Airport, but I thought it was a cool airport that somebody might fly into at the time. <laughs> so uh, I, I liked that I could embellish like that. Again, to the essay form, I think you can, you can play with, uh, we, you can play with form and um, play with time and play with, um, you know, facts in that way. It's an elastic form. Philippa has a question now. Uh, she says, she's wondering, she's curious if you've ever done, thought about genetic testing um, to find out your birth father. Have you, uh, have you ever been interested in finding relatives through 23andMe and the like? That's such a great question because, you know, I, I've never done those and I don't know why necessarily. Uh, I've always sort of wanted to do those, but an interesting side note is I have a cousin on my, what I think is my biological father's side who found me through an early essay I wrote about in the book about trying to Google my birth father. <laughs> And she, of all things, I get, uh, I got a message from her. I probably was on Facebook years ago. And she's like, you know, I think you're talking about my uncle. And so interestingly, I didn't need 23andMe to bring like my birth father's family out. Uh, and I think I will do it at some point, just because out of curiosity, like, I don't know. What if I'm really not Hungarian or what if, you know, we came from, I, I I'm very interested in place. So I want to know exactly where I came from in terms of not just Hungary per se, or somewhere in England, but like the exact place. Cause you know, then I'm going to go over and visit. <laughs> I'm going to go visit. I'm going to see the place. I want to see people who look like me because I think as adoptees, that's really important. Whether, you know, I mean, I'm white, I was adopted into a white family. Um, but regardless of that, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I never felt like I looked like, you know, I looked like my sisters or my, or my, you know, my mom and dad, um, even though we all had brown hair and, you know, blue eyes. So there's a bit of an identity thing to, to doing that. But again, you have to be ready for like some surprises. So, Yeah. Well, I'm afraid we are just about out of time, but uh, there's one last uh, question from Orit Bindori, and she says, as someone who is uh, soon to be an adoptive parent, um, what, what kind of thoughts would you share with her? Listen, Orit, I, the one thing like in, in this book that with the Domicon babies and with all this like weird, you know, the science of baby raising, the one thing that was missing in all of that, and in many ways in the early phases of adoption was, you know, you cannot teach someone how to love. And there is no science for how to be a loving parent. And 
um, I think you go forth and be a loving parent. And that is, and I know you will, because I know you. And that's the best you can do for your child. And no matter if you've had them or if you've raised them, I know I was raised with great love and, um, and I'm very grateful for that. And that's, that's what I try to carry on to my kids too. And I'm definitely not a perfect mother. Nobody is. So don't pretend that we're going to try to be that because that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Well, Megan, Jenny, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a wonderful event. Um, the book is The Guild of the Infant Savior. You can or order it at NorthShara.com. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to everyone thank for coming. Thank you both so much. And Megan, the idea of ending with that idea of go forth and be a loving parent is a beautiful thing to end on. So thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you all. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye.